So thanks everyone for joining us uh, today in this series of talks uh, organized by the Institute of Computing, uh, University of Campinas uh, here in Campinas, São Paulo and uh, by PUC Rio, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, this talk is part of what we called uh, Conexão Rio Campinas or Rio Campinas Connection. It's also supported by the Recode AI, Artificial Intelligence Lab here in the Institute of Computing, and uh, two hubs of AI, uh, one on cognitive architectures and one on health and well-being. We, are, we have the pleasure today to have here uh, Professor Mush Vardy. Uh, he's going to talk about ethics or the lack of ethics in AI. And uh, the interesting part of the discussion is also uh, about what happens when some companies advertise they have a, a, a ethics, but what they do in practice is a little bit far from ethics. So uh, Professor Vardy is um, associated with uh, Rice University. Um, he's a distinguished professor in computational engineering at Rice, where he's a leading uh, he's leading an initiative on technology, culture, and society. Uh, his interests focus on automated reasoning, which is a branch of AI with broad applications to computer science in general, including machine learning, database theory, computational complexity theory, knowledge in multi-agent systems, computer-aided verification, and teaching logic across the curriculum. Uh, he he's also a faculty scholar at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. I uh, remember uh, the first time that I have had the contact with Professor Vardy, it was my first uh, paper in communications of ACM. So it was quite a few years ago, but it was a pleasure to interact and uh, the whole process of revision was uh, very educative. So Professor Vardy, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you all for joining me on this Friday afternoon. Let me share the screen. That's the part I'm almost nervous about. Okay, let's go there. Share screen, where is your screen here? Okay. Okay, good. This is the part that makes me nervous. So I want to talk to you today about uh, about ethics in, in, in AI, or as somebody said, the lack of it. Because a lot of talk about ethics, so I'm going to try to put it in a, in a very broad context. And I'll start, I'll start the context by just giving kind of very, very brief history of AI. It goes back to the late 50s, 1958 is typically con considered the, the beginning of um, research in AI. And at the beginning, the people were very optimistic. How hard can this artificial intelligence thing be? And then uh, in Simon and Newell, two pioneers, they said, okay, chess, eh, give us 10 years, we'll do chess. Uh, within a decade, Marvin Minsky was even more ambitious. Within a generation, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will substantially be solved. Well, the problem was a bit, a bit more difficult than they thought. And there were periods where there was total disillusionment with AI because it was a field that always overpromised and underdelivered. So was a, in the 70s, there was a period of so-called the first AI winter, and then again in the 80s, the second AI winter. In fact, when I was a, a graduate student, AI was, had an, a, you know, a bad reputation. It's like what we call in English, you know, a snake oil salesman, you know, always promised, never deliver. But things start changing. Starting from the late 90s, we had several achievement in AI that we consider to be breakthroughs, okay? The first one was in 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov in chess. Here you see Kasparov walking away from the table. This was the second game of the tournament. He lost the second game. Please ask everyone to mute themselves. And uh, you see he's walking away kind of disgusted and he never recovered from that loss and he, he lost the tournament. And that was a huge milestone in the history of AI. 
And then we had in 2011, again, IBM, Watson defeated two great Jeopardy players. And then 2016, now it was Google in the lead, AlphaGo uh, beat a Korean Go Master in a, in a tournament. So really major accomplishment by AI. In particular, the, the Go is important because the Go board game is larger than chess and only one type of piece, okay? They're black and white, so there are no, you don't have variety. So there are many more configurations. So the brute force technique that IBM used in 2000, in 1997, was, cannot apply to Go. Go, Go, you cannot search the game tree as deep as you need. So what happened is that uh, AlphaGo used machine learning. So it used tree search technique, but to prune the search tree, it used machine learning. And what it means is that AlphaGo develops intuition for playing the game, because if you ask a Go master, how do you play the game? They have a vague sense of what is a good position and a good move. They have deep intuition. And now AlphaGo has this intuition. And this offers a response to a paradox known as the Polanyi paradox, phrased by the philosopher Polanyi in 1966, said, look, there are many people who, know, who can drive, but you ask them, explain to us exactly when you approach a red light, you push the brake. How do you know exactly how, how to push the brake? And no, no, we can't say, we just have a sense of how to do it based on experience, right? We don't want to brake too fast or brake too slow. And so he wrote, we, we know more than we can tell. The skill of a driver cannot be replaced by thorough schooling in the theory of the motor car. So the, the paradox was, if we can't tell how we drive, how can we program a car to drive? And then now we know what the answer is. The answer is machine learning. And indeed, within, you know, over the last few years, we've seen many tech companies trying to automate driving. Well, it turns out that it's a bit more difficult than we thought. And we had some unfortunate uh, incidents. We have a Tesla car hitting a concrete barrier in 2019. And there was an investigation. And NSTB, which is a National Transportation Safety Board, it's an, a government agency, they say, well, the problem was the, the, the car. The car was driven semi-autonomously and the software failed. And in fact, NSTB said uh, in, in 2020 that unless Tesla made significant changes into autopilot system, there will be more, more crashes are, are expected. And then a worse accident also in 2018 was by an Uber car. There was a safety driver on board, but the safety driver was dis distracted and a pedestrian was killed. And again, NSTB said Uber did not have a formal safety place uh, in safety plan in place. In fact, they have disabled automated braking because it, it created uh, unpredictable braking. So, but eventually the driver was, was uh, charged, was homicide because apparently the driver, I think, played video game. And Uber, who was really responsible for that, managed to get out with no charges. And so this is started the disillusionment. Around 2017, 18, the disillusionment with AI started. Uh, in fact, in 2016, ProPublica published an a, a ex expose. So there is, there is a, there is software used across the country to predict future criminal, and it is biased against blacks. Now, why is it biased against blacks? because it learns from the data. And we, we know that the, the, there is a very unfortunate and sad history in the United States of discrimination against blacks. It's in the justice system. So there is a, there is a conventional phrase, those, who, learn, who, those who, who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But with machine learning, those who learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And in 2017, a book came out by Kathy O'Neill, Weapons of Math Distractions, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. New York Times wrote a frightening look at how algorithms are increasingly regulating people. And that led to a phenomenon known, known, known as the tech clash, as the backlash against technology. Peggy Noonan was a Wall Street Journal columnist wrote in October 2017. She wrote about gun ownership and the, the argument was very weak in my opinion, but it's important to read what she writes. She wrote because all of their personal and financial information got hacked in the latest breach because our company's real overloads are in Silicon Valley 
and appear to be moral Martians who operate on some weird new postmodern wavelengths. And they will be the one programming the robot that will soon take all the jobs. So suddenly we had uh, the technology has received very bad image in the, in the public eye. And the response to that has been, it's an ethics crisis. New York Times wrote in 2018, tech ethical dark side. Boston Globe, ethics crisis. New York Times, we now need CEO, should be something new, chief ethics officer. VentureBeat, a technology publication, tell us about Facebook that funded Institute for AI and Artificial Intelligence with seven and a half million dollars. So Facebook is such an ethical company, it, it donated seven and a half million dollars to the Technical University of Munich to form Institute for Ethics in AI. Uh, now you can get uh, books on AI ethics. There are, there are philosophers write books on AI ethics. Uh, the Vatican issued a, a Rome call for AI ethics uh, by the Pontifical Academy for Life and signatories such as Microsoft and IBM and other organizations and they sign it. The values and principles that we are able to instill in AI will help to establish a framework that regulates and act as a point to, for reference for digital ethics. We need AI to be ethical. And companies jump on the bandwagon. So Google says they have a web page. You can find it on responsible AI practices. And they said the development of AI is creating new opportunities to improve the lives of people around the world, for businesses to healthcare to education. But it's also raising new questions about the best way to build fairness, interpretability, privacy, security into the system. So Google cares very much about, about ethical AI. And when, when, uh, when Facebook issued the, uh, uh, funded the, the Institute of Ethics and AI in Munich, the press release says, at Facebook, ensuring the responsible and thoughtful use of AI is foundational to everything we do, from the data label we use to the individual algorithms we build to the system they are part of. So these companies claim to be very, very ethical. But in 2018, a Dutch philosopher, Ben Wagner, wrote an article called Ethics as an escape from regulation, from ethics washing to ethics shopping. And I borrowed the phrase ethics shopping from him, ethics washing from him. And in a nutshell, he writes, much of the debate about ethics seems to provide as easy alternative to government regulation. These companies want to talk about ethics because what they're really afraid of is regulation. So let's go deeper into this issue of ethics versus, versus regulation. So let's compare to another big technology what was the biggest technology of the, 19th, of the 20th century? It was the automobile. Computers, of course, are the biggest technology so far of the 20th century, or 20, 21st century, but the 20th century was a century of the automobile. So 1908, the Ford Model T, all of the manufacturing line, became the first mass-consumed, mass-produced car. And what did we discover? People get killed by automobiles. So we have spent over 100 years now trying to deal with this. And uh, transportation uh, experts measure it by death. This is this red line here. Okay, death per billion VMT. VMT is on vehicles miles traveled. When you travel a billion miles, how many people die? And you see that uh, the early in the 20th century, it was over two, of almost 250 people. And now, uh, by 2015, it was it was a uh, less than 10 people, fewer than 10 people. So we have made a dramatic progress in improving the safety of or reducing fatalities as a result of uh, car crashes. And how did we do it? By a whole bunch of measures. We build better cars, we have mirrors, we have anti-lock brakes, we have airbags, we change the city, we have crosswalks, traffic lights, we change the laws, we have D DWI, driving while intoxicated. A driver are supposed to get safety training. What did we not do? We didn't say the solution is ethics training for driver. Driver, would, we teach them ethics, so they would know that it's unethical to drive too fast. They would know that it's unethical to drive while intoxicated. No, we pass laws say it's illegal to drive fast. 
it's illegal to drive while intoxicated. So we had public policy. We didn't say it's about ethic. We say it's about public policy. So now I want to contrast it with, for example, using machine learning in the justice system. So in April 2017, the Chief Justice of the United States, John G. Roberts, visit a RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and he's having a fireside chat with the president of RPI, Shirley Ann Jackson. And she asked him, can you foresee a day when smart machine driven by artificial intelligence says, will assist with courtroom fact finding, or even more controversially, judicial decision making? And he said, it's a day that's here, and it's putting a significant strain on how the judiciary goes about doing things. The New York Times described it, an algorithm that grants freedom or takes it away. So the machine learning is already being used in the justice system in many applications, such as bail, sentencing, parole, separating children from parents. And why are we using machine learning? Because these are very difficult decisions for human, be human beings to make. These are profound decisions, huge impact on people's life. So you know what? Why should we make such hard decisions? Let machine learning make the decision. So let's say, and you can find a, a company such as North Point. They have a beautiful website, but advancing justice and embracing community. And who can, who can disagree with advancing justice and embracing community? But, but the problem is that we have let algorithm makes very, very, very human decision. Michel Alexander, New York Times, wrote about it. He said, we have a frightening system of incarceration. Jim Crow is a system of laws in the United States. Only, this law is only repealed in the 1960s during part of the civil rights movement. And this law discriminated against, against uh, blacks in the United States. And now we have machine learning discriminated against blacks because it learns from history. And Michel Alexander Wright, these advanced mathematical models, if you're colorblind on the surface, but are significantly influenced by pervasive bias in the criminal justice system. And just to, let's use a parable here, just to show how, how absurd the situation is. Let's imagine that I'm training my dog, Fluffy, to detect risk of recidivism. Recidivism means proclivity towards uh, going back to crime. And this is a major consideration when people get parole. Will they go back to crime? So I trained Fluffy to detect recidivism. And I've taken Fluffy to the federal court system here in uh, Texas. In Acura has been tested. If you take Fluffy to smell someone, and if there's risk of recidivism, Fluffy barks. If no risk, Fluffy licks. But as you can see, Fluffy is a black box, it does not provide explanations. So should we allow Fluffy to make parole decisions? Should we give Fluffy ethics training? Now, of course, it's ridiculous. But how is Fluffy different than a black box of machine learning? I claim it's not much different. It's a black box. We don't understand what's happening inside. And the unfortunate thing about Judge Roberts, Justice Roberts, he's the chief regulator of the federal court systems. It is his job to regulate. And unfortunately, right now, this machine learning in the system is unregulated. In 2018, uh, Jim Larus and Chris Henkin wrote in CACM about regulating automated decision systems. And they wrote, the disdain for regulation is pervasive throughout the tech industry. In the case of automated decision making, this attitude is mistaken. Why? The widespread adoption of AD system will be economically disruptive and will raise new and complex societal challenges. We shouldn't delegate such big decisions to machines. So I want to take kind of a running, running example, which is the internet. So let's look at the background from the internet. And when I mean, mean internet, I don't just mean TCP IP. I mean the whole internet ecosystem, the communication infrastructure. And today when people talk the internet, they don't mean that, they mean the application running on top of it, the application layer. And the root of this is you go back to the 1980s and you find the roots of today's internet. You find, for example, the well, 
which was a dial-up bulletin board. And if you're old enough, you may remember Usenet, which was, again, social media, early social media, Unix to Unix discussion board. And the, the, the culture of the time was the so-called counterculture. It came just after the, 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 the 60s, the Vietnam War. It was very anti-government, anti-establishment. You, you may remember you've read about the hippies. And out of this anti-establishment movement came the mantra, information wants to be free. Now, information doesn't want anything. Bits, bits don't have a free will. But somehow this became adopted. Oh, we don't want the government to regulate it. So information should be free. But and in fact, when you look at Tim Berners-Lee, when he, when he develops the, the World Wide Web in the late uh, 80s, it was all about unfettered public sharing of information. The more, the merrier. But if you remember these days, very quickly, we had a problem. There was too much information. How do you find information on the web? The first solution was Yahoo had a directory. It's, they said, library of catalog, we'll have a directory. Then the internet grew too fast. It didn't scale. The web grew too fast. It didn't scale. People said, no, no, we need search engines. But the initial search engines were bad. You got really bad order. You have to go page after page after page to find something that's good. And Google came up with a page, with a page rank, with a brilliant algorithm, and uh, it, Google became a huge company. But of course, they had a question. If information is free, how do you monetize free information? How do you make money? And Google said, wait a minute. Broadcast television is free. Newspapers are very cheap. How do they do it? Advertising. So they decided their business model will be really advertising. They don't sell you information. They sell, they sell advertise, advertisement to advertisers. But then we discover that online advertising is very ineffective. And the solution to that was another brilliant idea, micro-targeted advertising. We will target the advertising, advertiser to the preference of individual user. And that means we have to collect data of these individual users. In fact, you have no idea how much information Google has on you. You think Google knows maybe everything you do online. No, Google knows everything you do offline. Every time you use your credit card, Google knows about it because the information is available at the credit card company and Google buys it because they, know, they want to know what you buy online and offline. So if you think about machine learning today, Machine, you are the subject of machine learning every day now because target advertising is using machine learning to decide what advertisement you're going to see. So here's an example. You can go and write a query, what is Exxon? And what advertisement you're going to see depends on what Google thinks you are. If Google thinks that you are uh, poor sustainability, you'll see a beautiful picture about carbon CO2 ca capturing. And you see b beautiful beautiful white clouds. But if they think that you're conservative, you're against regulation, you're going to see a petition against regulation. So you, same search, you're going to see very different advertisement depending what Google thinks you are. And in 2019, an important book came out. It was called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And that's how she nicknamed this whole phenomenon of, of uh, selling your data. Companies really getting your data and selling your data to advertisers. The Silicon Valley term from this is, if you're not paying for it, you are the product. You are the product. You are not a customer of Google. You are a user of Google. The customers are the advertise, advertising companies. And after the January 6 insurrection in the United States, Shoshana Zubo brought an article in the New York Times, and she wrote the coup we are not talking about. She wrote, we, have, we can have democracy or we can have surveillance society, but we cannot have both. And by, by uh, 2021, Tech Magazine wrote a question. Are we living in tech dystopia? And most of them were about 10 or 11 responses. And most of them said, yes, we are living in tech dystopia. And this, here is a, a cartoon from that. And what you remember, what you may remember that what happened after the insurrection was that Facebook kicked uh, Trump off Facebook and off, off, uh, off Twitter. And you see here that we are, the progressive are thinking, thinking big tech, but big tech is now sitting like an octopus 
on top of the on top of the Congress on top of the Capitol. And Facebook is also using machine learning in, in a massive way because Facebook the, the, the machine learning is used for content moderation. What you see on Facebook wall is determined by machine learning. And the goal there is to maximize user engagement. And how do you do it? By nano-targeting. What you see is tailored to what, what, you what, what Facebook thinks is your perceived interest. And now we are really gradually see that the social media is been, been made addictive by design. So social, social media is now become, has become addictive and you have psychologists who design it to be addictive. New, NYU wrote in February 2021, social media use driven by the search for reward akin to animal seeking food, new study shows. So it's addictive and it's been designed to be addictive. Uh, an extreme case is the relationship of what's happening with technology and children. Uh, Richard Fried, a psychologist, wrote in, 2000, in 2018, none of the parents understand that the children and teens' destructive obsession with technology is the predictable consequence of virtual unrecognized merger between the tech industry and psychology. So tech is designed to be addictive. And what is the consequence of this? For example, you look at children between 10 to 14, kids, teenage, early young teenagers, suicide rate amongst the children between 2007 and 2017 nearly tripled. So we have deployed this technology and our children are paying with their life. It is so disturbing to see that we have deployed technology that caused the increase in suicide rate for children and young teenagers. And what is driving it? Well, it's we don't know exactly. It's how to run control experiment. But we do know the iPhone was introduced in 2007 and the Facebook iPhone app was introduced in 2008. And so the fact that suicide rate has grown, uh, has tripled among, among uh, 10 to 14 in the 10 to 14 age group is very likely the result of social media impact on, uh, on, on, on them. And, and cyberbullying is known to be a major phenomenon. Now, how well has this business model worked for Google, for example, or surveillance capitalism? You can see that it's worked incredibly well. I mean, by 2020, Google made almost almost $150 billion for, from, from, from advertising, just from advertising. So imagine we take Sergey Brin and Larry Page, the two co-founders of Google, and we send him to the ethics bootcamp, maybe in Munich, in this Institute for AI Ethics. Do you think they're going to back to, to Mountain View and tell people, oh, we made a mistake. This was this is unethical. Let's stop doing targeted advertising. Of course not. This is incredibly profitable. They may have ethics concerns, but they're not going to do anything about it. And in 2019, let me quote myself, I wrote, if society finds the surveillance business model offensive, then the remedy is public policy in the form of laws and regulation rather than ethics outrage. But remember, Google wants to pretend that it's an ethical company. So Google is stuck between what I call its ethics theater, ethics facade, and an unethical business model. And that led to the, to the Timnit Gebru uh, scandal. So this is from Wired magazine in June of 2021. She was a star engineer who warned that messy AI can spread racism. Google brought her in, then it forced her out, can big tech take criticism from within? Well, of course, the answer was no, they couldn't. She was fired. In fact, what happened was that uh, she was fired in 2020 because Google management wanted her, wanted her to withdraw a paper. She said no. Then uh, Google fired another uh, top researcher that uh, tried to support Timnit Gebru. And then there were many other people who were forced to leave, leave Google. And by March of 2021, there was an ethics AI ethic research conference that decided to suspend Google sponsorship. Now Google is saying they're going to stop tracking us across multiple websites. We will see. The basic business model is surveillance. That's a basic business model. So I'm very skeptical of, of anything that Google say with respect to privacy. Uh, Facebook is not different, 
by, by uh, the fall of, of uh, last year, uh, the Facebook paper, there were a lot of leak, paper were leaked from inside Facebook, and the Wall Street Journal wrote an expose about all this paper, and the point is that Facebook, inside Facebook, they knew, here, these are quotes from, from, from document inside Facebook, who make body image issue worse for one in three teen girls, who are not actually doing what we say we do publicly. Misinformation, toxicity, and, and, and violent content are inordinately prevalent among researchers. An unfortunate side effect is that harmful and misinformative content can go viral, often before we can catch it and mitigate its effects. So inside, inside Facebook, they, know, they knew about this issue, but what, do they, what does Mark Zuckerberg really care about? Profits. But we need to understand the issue is just bigger than just, okay, privacy issues. Are these services, we think I get Facebook and Google for free. Are they really free? Well, how does Google make $150 billion from advertising? Where does the money come from? So you say, ah, it's from advertising. No, wait a minute. Where do, how do the advertisement get, where do the advertisement get the money? Alex Webb of Bloomberg wrote, the whole web pays for Google and Facebook to be free, and it should be free in quotes. Because the reality is consumer ultimately pay, pay the price because advertiser pass the cost to their clients and they pass the cost to consumers. So we have, there is invisible tax on everything we buy and that tax goes to Google and Facebook, but in a totally opaque way. And so we got mass surveillance to get these free services. And what you'll hear from the industry is, well, people give their data willingly for free services. The answer is very few people are fully aware of how much data the tech company has on them. For example, if you go on Facebook and you click, you go down enough in the menus, you can find that Facebook has a profile on you. Well, about 75% of users do not know that Facebook maintain a profile of them. When you, share the, when you show them the profile, they become very uncomfortable, the majority are uncomfortable, and a significant portion say, no, that's not me. So, I mean, let's take this audience here, okay? So we have uh, uh, over 60 people here. If I ask you, do you use Gmail? I bet that over 90% people say, yes, I've used Gmail. It's very convenient. And I ask you, but every time you use Gmail, you, you agree to the terms of services. Have you read the terms of services? And I, I would bet that among the, the 90 plus percent of the people who do use Gmail, 90 plus percent never read the terms of services. You have no idea what, what rights you gave, you, gave, uh, you gave Google. So some people call it the con of consent. There is co official formal consent, but in reality is we have no idea what rights we gave Google. And beyond that, take it, uh, take it, take it at Google's IP. Google has patents. Oh, they protected IP incredibly well. Why? Because it's very valuable for them. But what about all, what about the IP, the rest of IP? So the point is, if you are newspapers today are, are get, going out of business because people think it should be free, I shouldn't be pay for that. So the idea is that information is, a, is something that people should pay for. It's gone out of the way. No, people aren't willing to pay for anything. Now, especially our students today, they have no concept of copyright and, and trying to maintain copyrights. So, so Google and Facebook have destroyed the, the information market. And I described it in, in 2010, I wrote how the hippies destroyed the internet. But if you think about this issue, you can agree or disagree, disagree with me on that. But clearly this is not an issue of ethic. This should be an issue of public policy. Do we want to have an information market? What kind of information market do we want to be? It's not an ethical issue. It should be a, a policy issue. So let's think about policy. There is very little IT policy. Why? Well, one reason that we have a huge tech, tech industry, I mean, in, uh, in January of this year, I made an estimate, what is the market, market capitalization of the big top five, which is Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Facebook. It was around $10 trillion in market capitalization. It was at least one third of the S&P 500, which is the top 500 companies in the United States. Their estimated 2021 revenue was close to $1.5 trillion. And this powerful industry with huge amount of 
uh, uh, of money has lobbied vigorously against any regulation under the mantra regulation stifles innovation. For example, in, in 2018, Elon Musk was accused of trying to manipulate Tesla stock price by Twitter and the, the, the investigation was started against him and Wired Magazine, a very techy magazine, jump. The case again, Elon Musk will chill innovation. So Elon Musk should, should be able to violate the law because otherwise we would stifle innovation. This is the, this is the conventional wisdom in Silicon Valley. But it's not just the industry. I would say there is something, even the whole tech community. There is this what I call techno-utopian culture. And it was to me epitome, epitome you know, uh, the, it was put forward by John Perry Barlow in 1996 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. And this is the opening, the opening sentence. Government of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past, leave us alone. So this should be completely unregulated. It's the home of the mind. So this kind of, of utopian culture, then somehow assume that what happened in cyber, cyberspace stays in cyberspace. But we understand today that this is not what happened in cyberspace does not stay in cyberspace. For example, could there be a cyber attack on the, on the US power grid, on any country's, country's power grid? The answer is a distinct possibility. In fact, the Wall Street Journal did an, a, an investigation and there were Russian full footprints in, the, in America's electric electrical grid. Uh, some of the big providers have very good cybersecurity, but there are some small providers and uh, there seem to be attempts to penetrate them just to experiment with it. There has no, been no attack yet, but it's not out of the question such attack may happen. And this utopian culture gave rise later to the so-called disrupt disruption culture. So in 1995, Clayton Christensen, a business professor in Harvard, coined the phrase disruptive innovation, which was a process by which you have a new technology or a product, and it, disru it, it disrupts the old technology. And he gave an, ex an example of disruptive technology. So today these drives are, are, are year big, but way back they were at some point year big, and they got smaller every time you need new technology to make it smaller. And every time there was a new company with new technology which disrupted the previous, the previous, the previous companies. Now Christensen was, was descriptive. He said, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing disruption. But now disruption has become a Silicon Valley mantra. Let's disrupt. Let's disrupt. And, and Victoria Hefferman, New York Times in 2020 wrote, ennobling destruction and sabotage makes the most brutal form of capitalism seem like goodwill like it's a good thing to disrupt. And from disruptive, we went to breaking. So, so Facebook until 2014, their, their motto was move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you are not moving fast enough. Now, breaking what? Well, if they want to bring the payroll system, I don't care. But now we know that Facebook frictionless sharing led to massive dissemination of fake news, misinformation, disinformation, and extreme content. And now we know the social media played a key role in many bad things that happened. And remember, Facebook knew about it. But insiders said Facebook CEO chose growth over safety. Growth over safety. And what does the breaking things led to? It led to the capital insurrection in June, January 6 of 2029. The United States was very, very close to losing its democracy on this day. The details are there is a congressional investigation when the public when the report will become public i expect to be shocking utterly shocking now what some people said the solution to that should be corporate responsibility so let's talk a little bit about corporate responsibilities what is corporate responsibility well if you go and look what is the definition you look at the business literature it's a form of of social responsibility Companies that were willing to sacrifice some profits for social goals. If you went to a CEO in the in the 1960s and you asked him, how do you exercise corporate social responsibility? The CEO would tell you, well, I have to balance many stakeholders, my shareholders, 
my customers, my employees, the community, and I have to balance between all of them. And it's a, it's a, the CEO will tell you it's a very delicate balance. But what happened in the United States in roughly in the early 80s, the dogma has become shareholder values. We don't care about community. We don't care about customers. We don't care about employees. We only care about one thing, make profits so we can enrich the shareholders. And this was based on, on a very influential article by Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist in 1970. And he wrote the sole responsibility of a business is to increase its profits. Now, by 2019, which is about uh, 50 years later, the Business Roundtable, which is an organization of the top 200 largest U.S. corporation, they said this was a big mistake. We need to go back to stakeholders. How well does it work? Yet to be remained. So clearly, technology is driving the future. But the question we should we should ask yourself: Who doing the steering? And the answer right now is tech corporations. Uh, technology has moved very fast, but public policy is lagged behind. And again, the mantra would be to regulation stifle innovation. But innovation is not a goal by itself. Innovation, innovation is just mean, means for societal progress. The real goal should be societal progress. Innovation has to accomplish it. And in, a, in September 20, 2020, the New York Times had an article called 50 years of a, of, about Milton Friedman. And, and, and Applebaum wrote, critics have been fighting ever since the great corporation to acknowledge broader responsibilities. It's the wrong battle. Instead of redefining the, the role of the corporation, we need to refine the role of the state. And the argument is government remain the most powerful mean to express our collective will. The necessary, the necessary solution whose create is to have laws and regulation that create stronger incentive for good behavior and laws against bad behavior. So is ethics important? Of course, ethics is important. Like the Rome call says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Of course, I agree with this. How can I not agree with it? And ethics should inform public policy. In the, 19, in the 1950s, Chief Justice Errol Warren wrote, in civilized life, the law floats in a sea of ethics. Ethics is important. Why is ethics important? Because ethics guide us. But the law is institutionalized. Ethics is not. Without laws and regulation, ethics is a subject of philosophy books. What, is, what, do, what does the law have? We have the justice system. That's what we have. The law is institutionalized. Ethics is not. Now, I teach a course at Rice on community ethics and society. I want my, our students to learn about computing and ethics and society. But this is not a way to manage the corporations. Now, clearly, it's become very clear the regulation is coming. Tim Cook wrote about, about, about regulation. We all deserve control of our digital life. That's why we must ring in the data broker. Reuters wrote in, in January of 2020, Alphabet CEO backs temporarily ban on facial recognition tech. Mark Zuckerberg himself says we need regulation. The internet needs new rules. Washington Post, why 2020 would be the, a watershed year for tech regulation. So even the industry expect a, a regulation to come. Now, regulation is not easy. I mean, one of the things that uh, you find out that if, current, if a country does not have good governance and regulation, when I gave once a talk about this to an audience in Romania, and Romania is a, is a, we don't have good governance, and I tell them about we need regulation, and people tell me, wait a minute, regulation is invitation for corruption. So doing regulation is hard. The difference between countries, how to regulate, we need some international treaties. And a huge question is, is big tech too big? And there are some people who argue that we need to make big tech smaller. For example, maybe we should, feel, should force Facebook to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp. And the biggest, to me, the biggest policy question is what I would call the social trilemma. 
again New York Times, an article by Emily Bazelon, why is big tech policing speech? Because the government is not. So what is the social trilemma? We are uncomfortable with government doing it. We are uncomfortable with Silicon Valley doing it. But we are also uncomfortable with nobody doing it at all. So we have a real challenge, how, what to do about, about social media. And here is just, just a very recent article, just this month. After the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, Facebook broke its own rules to allow for some calls to violence against Russian invaders. So Facebook generally does not allow for call for violence, but Facebook will allow some call for violence against Russian invader. So should Facebook be allowed to call for violence? So this is the social dilemma. Who should regulate speech on the internet? So I want to wrap up. Um, who drives technology? So the answer is society should drive technology. Tristan Green wrote an article about ethics of AI and he tried to make it very simple. He said, when we discuss ethics of AI, we're asking two simple questions. Is it ethical to build an AI for this specific purpose? Is it ethical to build an AI with these capabilities? And I think this is not enough. I think we also need to ask who benefits and who decides. And I'd like to finish by, by quoting Kate Crawford, who wrote last year, Stop talking about AI ethics. It's time to talk about power. Who wields the power to regulate technology? And I'll finish with the slogan, which is due to BMW. So BMW, the slogan used to be the ultimate driving machine. But now they're threatened by autonomous vehicles. So they change the slogan. The slogan is don't be driven by technology, drive it. And I think this is a good metaphor for our society. We should not be driven by technology, we should drive it. Thank you very much, and I would be very happy now to start a discussion. Thanks very much, Professor uh, Vardy. A very nice discussion. Uh, the, the stage was well prepared. Uh, we have several impacting themes, but I would like to start with, uh, with a question, which is, um, are you optimistic about the, the road ahead? What do you see uh, we could do in the next like 10 years to improve the scenario that you put here? So I'll tell you my, my perspective. I'm a, I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. Okay, my mother was in Auschwitz. So I'm very keenly aware that things can become very, very bad. So usually I'm, I'm a short-term pessimist. I look now what's happening in Europe, and I think that, that, that uh, ahead of us, there is some very rough time ahead of us. Okay? This is uh, Russia broke some norms, international norms, grossly with a brutal, barbaric invasion. In response, the West has now applied uh, broke norms of, of in terms of economic sanctions. So rough time are ahead of us. On the other hand, my mother survived Auschwitz and here I am. So I'm a short term pessimist and a long term optimist. In the long term, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. talk about the, the, the long arc of history. You know, things used to be much worse, right? We have slavery, now we don't have slavery. But, and it took a long time, you know, even after slavery, we have a hundred years of discrimination, of, of legal discrimination against blacks in the United States. But eventually it was removed. We still have now, we still have discrimination. But the long arc of history, I think, goes in the right direction. But that's why it's called the long arc of history. It may take a long time. And what we need to remember is also, it's up to us. We're not passive players in this. That's why I try to teach it to my students. They will they need to take action. And in particular, you know, I think our students need to think, is it okay to go work for Facebook, for example? And many people say, oh, it's a cool job. And I say, well, is it okay to work for a tobacco company? <laughs> and many people say, yeah, no, no, I just, it's legal, but I don't like the idea that I, I know that cigarettes cause cancer. 
So I don't I don't want to go for a tobacco company. I think people should have the same image of some of our tech companies. Yes, it's perfectly legal. They make money. It's a well-paying job. It's an interesting technical job. But should you not care about your ethics? Should you know what what is the to me what is the utmost ethical value? Make the world a better place. So if you are going to work for Facebook, are you making the world a better place? And all computer science students now, they're in great demand. I mean, they are incredibly privileged and fortunate. They can get many different jobs. The unemployment rate among people with a bachelor in computer science is is practically zero. Okay, anybody who has the skilled computer science can find jobs. Why should you go work for for companies with 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 uh, questionable ethics? And my hope is that people that ref will reform Facebook and Google will not necessarily by law, but just the, the people who work there eventually says, I don't want to work in this company. But it will take a while to get this. People are still saying, good jobs, well-paying job, technical, interesting. I'm just a plumber. I should, I, I'm not responsible for this. We have to change this attitude, I think. Very good. Uh, I give the... The word to Professor Marcos. Uh, he has a question. He's uh, he is a co-host of our event today. So, Marcos, please go ahead. Moshe, uh, thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you. Uh, I have a, a question. Your your uh, your play for uh, regulation is very um, um, coherent. But uh, we know that in politics and uh, the, the regulations are, are influenced also by, by lobbying. So how, how, how can we solve this? I mean, the big tech companies, they have the, the money. They can uh, pay uh, or have, give some advance to the, uh, the congressman. So how, how to, to ensure that the regulation is in terms of the, the, uh, the wealth of the, the society? So first, I want to quote the U.S. Constitution. It starts the following way. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, a more perfect union, not a perfect union, mm -hmm. OK? We all live in this world. None of us has perfect life. Anyone, I'll ask you, OK, do you have other imperfection of your life? The answer, of course, this is real life. Of course, it's imperfect. What do you have to do? Well, you have to work to make it a little more perfect. So the fact that something is hard and difficult does not mean we should give up. We should try to make progress. Now, I, I'm, I'm kind of a radical of this. I think that uh, uh, what we need in different countries is a better definition by law of, of, of what corporation can do and not do. United States, in fact, went backward. We said, oh, corporations are people. No, they're not people. For example, corporations have limited liability. Why should they have limited liability? I don't have limited liability. If I, if I cause, if I, uh, uh, you know, kill someone, it's my fault. And I may have to pay them millions of dollars. I may go bankrupt, okay? The court will not say, oh, you have limited liability. They'll take everything I have. And beyond that, I, even after selling my house and everything, I will still owe, owe money. I mean, I may be able to go bankrupt, okay? But the point is, why should corporations have limited liability? It's a privilege. They get this privilege, they should come with responsibilities. The responsibility should not be what they would like to have, stakeholder, shareholder. We as a society, we give, we give them the license to operate as a corporation. We should decide what are their responsibilities. And, and there is a move in the United States to, so there was a decision the corporation can give money, unlimited amount of money to politics. And I think that was very, it's called Citizen United. It was, I think, a very bad decision. And the way to address it, I think, is by constitutional amendment. But the amendment should not just look at one topic. It should look at what is corporate. We should define. It should not be up to business to define the responsibility. Society gave them the license to operate so I should tell them what are the terms of, of this, okay? And, you know, there are other examples, for example. Imagine that you have a, a, somebody who, who has a business, public business, and they decide, you know what, I don't like uh, black people, so I'm not going to sell them. The answer is no, it's illegal. 
you have a business society tells you there's some certain parameter of the business you don't have complete freedom in your house you could decide i don't want to have black friends okay you can be racist personally you can be racist but if you operate in public business no you cannot do that so society should define the rights and responsibilities of corporations very good point and uh, i would like to add one more complication here when you say that society needs to be aware and enforce this kind of thing you are assuming that we have an educated society educated society in terms of technology and also in general right so probably and i would like to hear you a little bit about this probably one of the most important things that we could do would be enforce education for everybody so a more educated people uh could do the things that we envision them to do right so i think public education was one of the great um mandatory public in, in education was one of the great innovation of the 20th century i mean you know it started probably before that but like high school that's became that's that was a in the 20th century i think elementary school was 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 before i mean when my when my when my father was growing up in romania in the 1930s it was mandatory three years of elementary education that was the mandatory okay three years which he did not get because <laughs> they were able to bribe the authority because he wanted to go to a Jewish school instead. So they bribed the authority and he did not even get that. He was a very intelligent man, but he formally he did not receive any elementary education. So unfortunately, now we are seeing some, 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 some uh, retraction of that. Suddenly we have a movement. Parents should decide what the children should, should uh, study. And in the name of this freedom, the answer is most places you have some notion of homeschooling. Okay, so we do allow some exception, but what we should not get is the subsidy of public education. The state is paying for public education, and you determine the the content of this education. And the reason that we install, we we legislated mandatory public education because exactly because we believe that that for democracy to work, you need educated citizenry. And and. Um, in fact, the, the interesting thing is you look at U.S. constitutions. So the U.S. is a is a democratic republic, but the people who wrote the constitution were were nervous about too much democracy. So so Karl Popper was a very important philosopher. Uh, he wrote a book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, and he realized he he was part of the Vienna Circle, and he realized that uh, the same way that Gödel showed us that too much truth leads to contradiction he showed that too much of many other things leads to contradiction too much uh, freedom means that the powerful can oppress the the less powerful okay and too much democracy for example the united states we went for more democracy and more democracy so we have for example we have the primary systems so before somebody runs for election the 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 people of the party votes on who should, should be the candidate so what happened in the united states is that in presidential election the the participation is is relatively low compared to other countries maybe around 60 in the low 60 percent but when you go to primaries who votes in the primaries only people who are have very very strong opinions so what happened is that more extreme people vote for the primaries so we end up electing people uh, who are, tend to be more extreme, either to the right or to the left. In all, in previous time, there was the the party decided who would be the candidate, and the party was wanted to make sure that the, the elect candidates that have broad appeal. So we have we have we have, in in some sense we have our democracy in the United States has deteriorated, because we thought oh we need more democracy more democracy more democracy. It's not a linear function. That's why you did. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an eternal search for, you know, for it's a local search. It's a continuous local search for more perfect union. Okay. Continuous local search. Graduate, graduate okay. descent, stochastic graduate descent. This is the best you can, <laughs> you, the best you can hope for. 
I have here a question now from Chris Souza. How do you see a possible way to impact tech in a good way with regulation considering increasingly opaque, less than democratic governments? So, again, I mean, the answer is it's, 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 it's going to be hard. You know, the, there is a famous speech by, by President Kennedy about going to the moon. And he gave the speech at Rice University in 1963. And he says, we don't, we don't go to the moon because it's easy, we go because it is hard. And as a metaphor he used, why does Rice play Texas? It's in the speech. And what he referred to is to football. Well, Rice is not very strong. University of Texas is a powerhouse in football. And we care too much about academics, so our uh, football team is not, is not as strong as... Uh, is Texas. Why does Rice, why does Rice play, play, uh, play Texas? Is because you have to be in the fight. Okay. So, um, you know, there is a problem. You know, if you op the same issue about openness. If you make if you make government too open, people are afraid. Sometimes there are some discussion that that are best uh, done privately. Okay. For example. They are very often you reach political in politics you need compromise. But as soon as you compromise, people say, Oh, you compromise on your principle. Oh my god, you're not standing up to your principle. Boo, boo, boo. The answer is, well, we have different opinions. And the way very often we do this, we go privately and you say, you know what, I'll compromise on X if you compromise on Y. But if you do it publicly, you cannot do that. So we get up with more extreme opinions. So we think that more openness and more transparency and more democracy is always better. It is not a linear function. We have lost that wisdom. The framework of the constitution knew that, this, that, that you have to do democracy carefully. Okay? And we, we seem to have lost some of this wisdom, that it's a delicate balance between too little democracy and too much democracy. For example, when, when I, I came to the United States, I went to California. And California has a, a, a political process called the initiative process, where you gather enough signatures, and then you bring it to direct vote by the people. Direct vote by the people. You bypass the legislature. You bring it to direct vote. It sounds very democratic. I went there, I said, wow, this is amazing. And then, I, then it took me a while to realize, this is a terrible idea. Why? Because first of all, you need to gather a million signatures. That costs a lot of money. So immediately, say only only somebody with money can can gather the signature. Then you need to reach all the voters. So again, doing publicity for this, you can pass a lot of money. You can you need a lot of money to advertise in a. This is a a, a, a state with close to 40 million people. So basically, it gave a. What happened is that that organization, mostly corporation with money, were pushing for it. You favor and, the rich. Yeah, it favors the rich. In the name of democracy, we favor the rich. And so we we have lost, I think the framer were the on one hand they were very anti monarchy, but they also watched the French Revolution. They were they were worried about the, the rule of the mob. And they wanted to have you know, manage democracy. And after that, especially in the 1960s, some of this back back room discussion, people say, no, 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 everything should be open. Everything should be transparent. We should vote on everything. And it's not necessarily, I think, has been a... And I'm not a, poli I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so this is just my own personal opinions. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question from Professor Marcos. But, but I do uh, know, but I do know about nonlinear optimization. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, what do you think are the main guidelines to create a good AI regulation? Where should we start discussing? So, you know, I think that uh, um, we think we need to regulate AI, but it really is not, take for example, automated deci decision, decision system, okay? Where the chief justice of the United States says, oh, this is happening. And my answer to him, you're in charge. You can decide what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. You can have, you establish the rules. And at the minimum, you can say, before we use any automated system, we should be audited. And we should have a discussion. What should it be audited for, for example? Should it have bias? 
you need to offer explanations. So um, think of me, okay? I'm a machine learning black box. People ask me all the time to make recommendation. I write lots of recommendation letter. Now suppose that I write a letter and it would say, the letter would say, I have decades of experience in computer science. I recommend that Anderson be promoted. One line, one line letter. What happened? People get the letter and it says, it's a useless letter. You're just telling us up, up, down, give us an explanation, right? So when I write a letter, the last sentence would be, I recommend this person for promotion, but I'll have a page and a half of explanation why I'm, I want this person to be promoted. So we must have explanation. But now we have, we, we don't have explanation. So we need to figure out what is, we need to regulate not AI per se, but we need to regulate the ecosystem around it, the business processes, okay? Very should, as, as I said, should Facebook have, should, was Facebook, why did we let Facebook, why did we allow Facebook to buy WhatsApp and Instacart? It's like, you know, you have, right now, if you think of Facebook, it's a company that has maybe like 3 billion users between the user for Facebook itself and WhatsApp and Instagram, okay? So you have about close to 3 billion people and Facebook has some control over the speech of these people. Who else had this power to control the speech of so many people? No one. I mean, you have China, okay, it's, we're talking about one and a half, 1.4 billion people. Mark Zuckerberg, by his policies, controlled the speech of almost 3 billion people. We need to discuss, yeah. do, we want, we do, do we want to allow that? That's what we need to discuss. Yeah. It's not getting into the details of the AI, okay? Very good. I have a question now from my colleague as well, Professor Paula Costa. Thank you for the very informative talk. As a university professor, my question is, it seems that AI regulation should, should be strongly based on technical information in a process that has the active participation from computer scientists and engineers. Well, however, it's really hard to attract people from these fields to this type of task. Do you know initiatives on computing schools that deals with this in a way that you think that is interesting? I'm looking for inspiration about how to approach the problem. So there is, there are some programs that are starting, for example, I think MIT has a master program in tech policy. So the answer is that this program, you need, you need to have some understanding of the technology and you need to know something about how to do policies, how to do regulation. So one of the students that took the course at Rice, my course at Rice on computing ethics in society, she told me after that she was going to do, she wanted to do a master degree. And really she was going to get a master in computer science. And after taking the course, she said, I'm inspired now to go in a different direction. I'm inspired to go in the direction of tech policy. She's going to write a master program She's going to study, get a master's degree in tech policy. We need a conversation between technologists and policy people. So I got involved, you mentioned, I got involved in the, in a rise the think tank for public policy. And I'm getting involved there because I don't have expertise in, in public policy, but I want to talk to them about bringing my expertise in computing and talk to them about people who expertise in policy. We need to have a conversation because right now we have two groups of people who are not talking to each other. Technologies don't understand policy and, and, and uh, policy thinkers, they're policy makers, which is a whole other story. These are the politicians, but they're policy thinkers. They're people who, they're policy studies. They don't understand the technology. We need to start a conversation. So a few years at Rice, in fact, I had a postdoc that uh, was focused on technology and public policy. And he taught a very nice course at Rice. After he left, unfortunately, we were not able to find the right person to teach it. The course was technology and public policy. And the way we did it, he co-taught it with a computer science PhD student. And every week, and this, the course was attended half by computer scientists and half from students from other part of the campus. And every week we had two lectures. One lecture was, here is a technology. And the second lecture was, here, here are the policy impact of this technology. 
And ACM, for example, now started something called ACM Tech Briefs. It's one word, Tech Briefs, and you can Google it and you'll find. And the issue, a tech brief is a, mem a memo. It's a few pages. It's a relatively short memo. And it describes a technology and it talks about the policy implication. And the idea is that this would be explain the technology, not to technologists, to people outside computer science. Here is, here is face, here is, let me explain to you what is face recognition. And let's talk about the, the policy aspects of face recognition, which is, again, something that people say, we need to regulate face, re face recognition. And so a colleague of mine wrote a blog uh, uh, some years ago. It was called Grow Up Computer Science. Okay. And I recently gave an interview and I described it. I said the following using the Star Wars Im imagery. We think ourselves are, as the rebels. We're not the <laughs> rebels anymore. We're not the rebels anymore. We are the empire. Okay. We need to start behaving. You know, we, we will tremendous power. And, and people think, oh, I'm just a nerd, I'm just a programmer. No, what you do changes the world. And we need to assume responsibility for what we have done, and we need to start behaving like that. Other disciplines went to such a moment of, oh my goodness, what have we done? The chem for the chemists, it was World War I and chemical weapons. And they came back, oh my God. For the physicists, it was World War II and the nuclear weapons. Okay? The biologists decided not to wait for such a disaster. And they went in 1975 and they wrote something called the Asilomar Declaration, okay? They said, let's, let's write some rules before something bad happens. We, you know, it's hard to see the future, okay? The, it's, it, 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 they say predictions are difficult, especially about the future, okay? We could not foresee how you take this technology. I got into, into computer science because I enjoyed programming, okay? That was it. Did I think about, you know, when I wrote a program in Fortran, did I think about how we're going to change the world? It was not, it was, if somebody would describe today's world, it would seem complete science fiction. Yeah. And now, you know, there is a, there is a British TV series, Black Mirror. Uh -huh. and, and last year, Wired Magazine wrote a review and they complained. They said, they said Black Mirror used to be dystopian. Now it's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> it's the present. <laughs> it's true. It's true. They say, we want dystopia. We don't want reality. It's not a reality show. We want dystopia. What happened to the exactly. dystopia? Well, the answer is dystopia. We bought the dystopia, right? I have another question from Marcelo. Um, what can we users do? This is very difficult. This is very difficult. Why? Uh, so, so a colleague of mine, there was an article in CSEM uh, maybe last year or two years ago, the consumer versus the citizen. All of us, are, we are two things. We are citizens. We vote, we elect politicians, and we could choose to vote on politicians that have the right, right policies, okay? But we are also citizens, okay? So take, for example, you think that I should say, you know, I hate Facebook, so I should boycott Facebook. But I like, I am a compulsive sharer, okay? Uh, I, still, I still have a website where I, you know, when I was a department chair at Rice, first I shared everything by making copies. People say, you are wasting too much paper. And so I created this, my own little website where I posted interesting things. It was, if you go to my website and you, you do slash M-I-C-H, M-I-S-C for miscellaneous slash M-I-S-C, you find, and they, they all stop at some point when there are other ways to share information, okay? And so, um, we, you know, so it's very hard. And, and if I quit, it's not going to change anything. I mean, take, I'll give you another example. I'm a, a very devout recycler. But if you ask me, why do I recycle? I tell you, because it makes me feel good. Does it really change the, does it really do anything for the environment? I'm very skeptical. I have no idea what happened with the stuff I with the stuff I recycle. It is probably goes to Africa into a dump in Africa. It's I'm skeptical it really gets recycled. Why? Because actual recycling is very expensive. And so it is cheaper to dump it in Africa than to really recycle it. And what happened is everybody just sells it. So the city picks it, my city picks up the recycling from me, 
they sell it to someone who 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 knows where does it end up so the answer is if we want to 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 make a difference we have to exercise our we, our citizenship kind of profile not our as a consumer we are all bad because we're addicted to convenience yes. we're addicted to convenience and if i tell you no 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 give up your convenience it's just very difficult okay yeah. but it's like telling you you know what you can uh, uh, i can take public transportation to work so i drive to from my home to the university it's 15 minutes it is it would be better for the environment if i took the bus but it takes 45 minutes in each direction. So convenience wins always. So, but we are all willing, you know, if I, if on the other hand, you ask me, are you willing to pay for higher taxes to mitigate, to do carbon capturing? I would say, yes, I'm willing to pay more. Okay. But don't get, take away my convenience from me. So we are all, we all have this split personality. We know we have bicam bicameral head, right? We are emotional on one side and rational on the other side. Convenience is the emotional part. We love convenience, but the rational exactly. part, the rational part, we say, let's have stricter, stricter environmental laws, even if it costs us money. Mm -hmm. So I agree. So I think I think we need to to the answer is we are not going to have an impact as consumers, but we can have impact as citizens. Okay, you know, tell tell the politician we want more regulation of technology. Okay, very good point. I have now okay. questions from Professor. Eduardo and Professor Jax, they kind of intersect. So it's interesting that you mention Citizens United uh, versus FEC. How do you contrast the trends in the EU and the US? Uh, do you think the EU is moving the right direction? And uh, Professor Jax is pretty much the same question. So how do you contrast, contrast the US approach to the ethics problem and the EU pro uh, uh, approach to the ethics problem? So, I mean, the, e, the, the US and the UK are still, they have still not fully outgrown the Reagan and Thatcher era, which was the market good, state government is bad. And under the, under the name conservatism, they actually put a very radical policy. They call themselves we're conservative. What are you conserving? This was a very radical policy, very radical free market policy. And it's actually not based on, on, on economics. I mean, it's based on some blind faith in the free market, which is not born by the, by, by the theory, okay? Like the free market always give you optimal result. Actually, computer scientists has visited this question because all we know about the free market, it gives, it yields an equilibrium. But, there are, but, but, but you look at equilibrium, there is a prisoner's dilemma, right? We know that there are bad equilibria and good equilibria. And so there's no guarantee, and people have studied this, Kirsten Papadimitriou, look at the computational on economics, and he showed that, that, that the, 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 it's called the cost of anarchy. You end up in a bad equilibrium, and it'd be very, very expensive. And if you could then negotiate the equilibrium by collective action of society, you end up in a much better equilibrium. Okay, so out of this blind faith, what people, some, some people call it market fundamentalism, and we have not outgrown it. They have diminished greatly the power of the states. Europe, other than the UK, did not go through this. Of course, there is another criticism of, of, the, of, of Europe. Sure, you are very happy to regulate American corporations. And it's true. If Europe had its own powerful tech industry, it's less clear they, they would have the political will to do that. But I like what Europe is doing. Now, you have to understand, stochastic gradual descent, so people say GDPR is very imperfect. Yes, I agree. It's very imperfect. Even experts would tell you there are many flaws in GDPR. The solution should not be to abolish GDPR. Okay. The solution be to improve GDPR. Learn, learn from what happened. Look at that and say, a more perfect. The, 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 what we should ask for is a more perfect regulation. There's no perfect regulation more perfect regulation that's what we can hope for and europe should do the same gdpr we tried it we tried it for for a few years let's go back revisit it and change if we have to very good i have now uh some questions but uh we are approaching the end so i have uh, time for at least one more professor claudia great talk a recent book index the history of 
shows that an index can induce some sort of view of the underlying information to induce bias from the Greeks onwards. In this sense, do you think that what's happening now is just an amplification of biases that always existed in the way information is organized or indexed? So I think the, so Google used, used the, it used to use the page rank. Page rank gave to rank the search result and that gave was very good result. The problem was it was not a resilient algorithm. You could manipulate it. In fact, the whole industry arose called search, search engine optimization. And uh, so Google retired page rank. And now how they do ranking of search result is a, is a trade secret. But I'm concerned that they, the way they do that, the algorithm is a black box. But very often what you know about the world is determined by the first page. You, run, you do what you do. You want to find something today. What do you do? You run a Google search and tell me when is the last time you went to page two of Google search. <laughs> so, so, so Google has tremendous control of what, what, you know, the epistemic, our epistemic construction of the world is very often determined by that. Now, it used to be, I mean, the same issue you can say against any kind of Encyclopedia Britannica. Of course, the editor determined something, but there was, there are more voices now, and the, the monopoly of the monopoly of Google. When is the last time you ran a, a Bing search? Okay, I sometimes use I sometimes use uh, when I don't want to be when I want to make sure that that uh, uh, somebody once asked me about what kind of weapons can you buy in the United States? We know you can buy a gun, but can you buy a machine gun? So I said, okay, I don't know if I can buy a machine. I want to run a search, and I thought, gee, I'm going to run. A Google search on how do you how do you buy a, a half an inch Browning machine gun, and the next thing is the FBI will show up at my doorstep. So to run that search, I went to Tor and I used Tor to run that search. Okay, and the answer is yes, you can buy a machine gun in the United States. Okay. Wow. <laughs> but but the monop the monopoly of Google, the problem is not just having Google. Of course, any search engine would. Would, would construct knowledge in some way. But the fact that we have one Google essentially and it's so dominant, that is a problem, okay? Now again, Google gives you no control over, you could imagine that there are many different algorithms and you could go and, and change some parameters. You say, I'm interested more in this, okay? I, I would like, I'm dedicated to betterment of the world. So give priority to things that are doing things for the better one of the world. You have no control over what, what Google shows, shows you, okay? And there's one Google, it's their algorithm. That algorithm construct your epistemic conception of the world. And that's a very bad thing. And this Thank is also partly, partly what, uh, what Shoshana Zuber talked about is epistemic disparity, she calls it. Okay, they know all about you, you know, you know very little about them. For Very example, whom, who, what does Facebook do with the data they collect on you? Do we know? We don't know. <laughs> no. To whom they sell. <laughs> to whom they sell. We don't know. Yeah. So, Professor, thank you very much for your time. It was great talking to you, having you here today. And I will end uh, this uh, section asking you uh, one question that Pretty much everyone here would like to know what are your suggestions on how to go next in terms of i i'm a student for instance i would like to learn more read more about these one or two books that you could recommend uh, yeah. what are the pointers that you could give uh, students here so let me put on the chart hold on give me a second i, I want to put something on the chart let me put it on the chart So this is a paper that's on my website. And it's a paper that I wrote with a colleague at Rice and it's called Deep Tech Ethics. It's a short paper, but it's about the course that we teach at Rice. And let me put it on the chart. So we develop 
a course at RICE, Computing Ethics and Society. And we say, okay, what should be the fundamental focus of the course? What is this tech ethic is about? And our conclusion at the end was that we need to look at how technology affect people, you know, with particular with less power. The people with more power, they take care of themselves. What about the people with less power? And we try to put social justice as part of the discussion. I would put even a broader way, betterment of the world. Okay, What do we do? What's our responsibility for making the world a better place? And we need to start talking to our students about this responsibility that they have. And in particular, as computer professionals, they have awesome power. And in, they need to take it with responsibility. And the way we can start changing the world is by telling our students that they have a responsibility for making the world a better place. Very good. That's a very good way uh, of finishing it. Thank you very much. In the name of the Institute of Computing at the mm -hmm. University of Campinas, and also the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro, here represented by the director, Professor Marco Zendler, I thank you once again for your time and looking forward to have other opportunities to discuss these interesting topics. Thank you very much. Be, be safe, be, be safe, be well. <laughs> Likewise. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye -bye. Obrigado. Obrigado.